Known for his mantra, marketing is about winning the battle for the mind, he brings proven strategies and tactics on how to build a brand that connects with customers emotionally and helps startups scale. He believes that marketing begins with storytelling. I really like this quote, by the way. It takes the art of storytelling to reach the heart and to build a bond. I believe that if you reach the heart, then you've captured the mind. Very well said. So please join me in welcoming to the stage the storyteller himself, Chander Patabaram. Right. Did I do that? Did I, was I okay? <laughs> Thank you. Appreciate that. Thank you. You did, you did a great job. So. Thank you. You know, I told her, just say Chandar like Bono and like Cher. There's only one name, Chandar, go for it. But uh, she didn't drive. Thank you, folks. Uh, thank you for the opportunity. I'm glad to be here and speak today. Yeah, my name is Chandar. And, you know, I'm not going to be talking about fintech. The good news is a lot of great fintech speakers. Speakers, I'm not an expert on it. But what I thought I'll talk about is a framework for scaling our companies and how do we do that. Just as a show of hands, uh, how many of us are in companies less than $50 million? Okay, about 20%. How many of us in companies between 50 and $250 million? How many of us in companies greater than $500 million? Great, and last question, how many of us in companies greater than a billion dollars? Okay, wonderful. So I got a story for all of us and talk about how do, you, how do we scale. Um, and my framework for scaling, being a classic rock fan growing up was Stairway to Heaven, and I'll talk about that. Um, so just a little bit about myself. I've had the pleasure of working in three different types of companies. Uh, one, what I call a small boat. Second, what I call a speed boat. And third, I call an oil tanker. So I've had the exposure to all these companies starting from less than 10 million to 100 billion. And some startups here called Cast Iron and Badgeville, public companies that are fast growth companies, like I was the chief marketing officer at Marketo, and now I'm, the, I'm privileged to be the chief marketing officer at Coupa Software. Um, and, and obviously, you know, IBM is a big company, and I've had the pleasure of being there for quite a few years. And, you know, just, I'm not going to talk about Coupa Software, but just to lend some context, I have some relevance to the space of fintech we're talking about. And what Coupa Software does is what Salesforce.com is to sales is what Coupa is to spend. So just like Salesforce.com handles all aspects of sales, sales, Salesforce automation, customer support, some aspects of marketing automation, service, customer services, et cetera. Similarly, we're on the spend side. Every company makes money. Every company spends money. And we are on the spend side. Procurement, rather than looking at it discreetly, we handle procurement, invoicing, expenses, sourcing, payments, et cetera, in one platform called the Businessman Management Platform. And just in the spirit of, okay, why am I equipped to talk about, what, am, what is my, talk about scale, in the last two years, we've gone from about $1.8 billion market cap to more than $9 billion market cap today. It fluctuates depending on the day, but that's kind of the scale that we have brought to the business. And, and really, from a FinTech perspective, just to give you, you know, 30 seconds in this, we handle the procure to pay process and, and one aspect is handling the procurement, the invoicing, the expenses, et cetera. That kind of is procurement to almost pay. And then the last aspect, the last mile problem we're solving using a fintech perspective is the actual payments itself. And that's our vision where you have a company on one side and you have all the suppliers. And we're providing an offering in the middle that provides the flexibility for a number of customers to pay their suppliers um, using Coupa Pay for purchase orders, for invoices, for expenses, et cetera, using a set of payment rails. The traditional payment rails like virtual cards, uh, bank transfers, et cetera, as well as some of the newer technologies and payment rails like blockchain, et cetera, and have this vision to provide all this flexibility to be the entire one single platform for procure to pay. But I'm not going to talk about fintech. I want to talk about how do we scale companies in all different aspects of fintech and grow it to this starting from you know, $10 million to $10 billion market cap. And what's the framework and the formula? For that, I want to start with something that, regardless of the product you build, uh, B2B or B2C, ultimately you want to have something called an emotional connection with our buyers. I want to start with that. Um, so as a case in point, uh, Nike is one of my favorite brands. How many of us have seen this ad for Nike that talks about the lightest shoe ultra-fast, dry technology, interwoven grip, talking about these great features. Anybody seen the ad? It's a great ad. Awesome. Actually, great answer. There is no ad from Nike. 
on the actual feature. Because 9Key is not talking to us about the feature, it's talking to us about the feeling, and that's how they connect with us. Not the feature, but the feeling. And they all talk to us about, you know, the, the fetal attraction with, my fetal attraction with the brand is not the soul of the shoe, but the soul of the story they're trying to say, which is that on believe in something, even if it means sacrificing everything. And you see this Colin Ka Kaepernick ad, and they try to connect with us emotionally. And you see the great Martin Luther King, one of the greatest speeches of all time, said, I have a dream. Imagine he started his presentation and said, I have a strategic plan. I'm not sure he would have connected that much with us in terms of, so, all more, so any business ultimately is trying to win the battle for the mind of a buyer, regardless of any FinTech product we build, and the battle for the mind stats for the battle for the heart are able to capture the emotion of that buyer. And one simple exercise that I would like all of you to do in your different companies, it's a simple exercise but very difficult to discern, is this exercise of saying, with your product, your buyer feels X. What's that feeling? X, one word. It's a simple exercise that we all should go through and, and see what's that primary feeling that we want to drive with our buyers in our FinTech products. Now, it's easier to do when you're consumer products than when you're trying to go do with B2B. Uh, but really, that's the feeling we want to get. And for example, in my business, Cooper, we sell to procurement officers. Um, procurement and finance. And the feeling that we want to get with our buyers is hashtag empowered. Because a lot of the times, the revenue side of the house in a company is, is sitting in first class drinking champagne, and the spend side of the house is sitting in the back of the plane drinking warm Bud Light for six bucks and some peanuts. So here's we are, can we provide something to them that makes them feel empowered and you know, gives them that seat at the table and the proverbial upgrade in their business. So that's the feeling that we want to get. So what that means is that anything we do as a brand, anything we do in an offering, are we making them empowered and coming back to this feeling. So that's what I would say is the primary principle of scaling is to start with, with, with emotion. Now, it doesn't start with emotion. It, I mean, it doesn't stop with emotion. This emotion is, con is to become a go-to-market motion for all of your companies. Uh, regardless of what fintech product you build, how do you convert this emotion into a go-to-market motion? And for that, being an old Led Zeppelin fan, any classic rock fans in the audience? Great, we got five of them. Maybe we, over cocktails, we'll talk about it. Um, the the I used to grow up liking a lot of you know British classic rock, you know Deep Purple, Led Zeppelin, etc. And little did I know that you know. My, my likeness for Stairway to Heaven would come and help me 30 years later after college, where I could actually use a framework to go build how to scale a business. So my framework today, for us, whatever, we've got a small FinTech startup. We are a $50 million company that's growing really fast in FinTech, or we're a multi-billion dollar company trying to go to the next level. How do we scale? And the framework I want to talk about today is my Stairway to Heaven, is awareness, acquisition, Adoption and advocacy. So I want to talk about these four stages that each one of us should look in our different businesses. We have the great you know, folks from Amazon speak. They're on one end of the spectrum, and then there's startups on this end of the spectrum. And how do you go scale across, span the spectrums by looking at these four years of awareness, acquisition, adoption, awareness, acquisition, adoption, and advocacy. So let's start with awareness. Now, if you're a small company, how do you build awareness today in today's world? Now, if you're Amazon or if you're you know, Nike or if you're some large bank in FinTech American Express, it's easier to build awareness because you have a lot of money. You can go find the next beautiful ad in Chicago Airport in O'Hare, or you can go find the next ad on CNBC or any you know, good TV network, and you can spend the money. But we small companies, many of us can't do that. So what is the strategy for any FinTech company that's growing to build awareness? Now, the challenge that we have today is first, we have to understand our buyer personas. I'm not sure as small companies, we all have gone through the process of saying, in every, the anatomy of every deal we do, especially in B2B, and this is a more B2B framework than B2C, because in B2C, you don't have champion, influencer, economic buyer, where in my case, my wife is the economic buyer, my daughter is the influencer, and I'm the champion. Maybe that's the B2C example. But in B2B, typically, you have somebody who's a champion for the technology, you have somebody who is the economic buyer all roads lead to, and somebody you have the influencer who's influencing the deal. And in, in our business, for context, for Coupa, the procurement executive is the this champion, the financial CFO is the economic buyer, and the influencer is the CIO. 
Now, why is this important? Is to build awareness, you have to understand who your buyer personas is and say, okay, how do I build awareness with them? As any small fintech startup or growing company. So the problem to build awareness today is this. We want to say a lot of stuff, but nobody's listening. There's nobody's listening. There's about 3,000 messages per day that hits us today. 3,000 messages per day. We can probably recall five of them. So the blast is happening to every one of us. So how do you recall anything, and how do you build brand awareness as, as a company? How do you stay in the mind of your buyer? Well, one traditional way has been try to be smarter, funnier, louder than the alternative, which is easier to do if you're Bud Light or Coors Light and have lots of money, but as a B2B marketing, you can't do that. So a methodology that I would, rec I would request us to look at is using education as a way to build brand. Teaching your prospects and earning the right to engage and build brand awareness. It's an interesting strategy to adopt because every buyer who wants to associate with their brand is looking at a gift to get equation, which is like, I am giving time what am I getting? If we are teaching them something, then it becomes relevant for them. And they say, okay, I'm willing to give you time. So my gift to get equation, if what I'm giving is lesser than what I'm getting, then that's great. The ratio is in my, the buyer's favor. So in this particular case, there's a great book. I don't know if any of us have read The Challenger Sale. Okay, there's a few gentlemen here. Um, that's great. It's a great book that talks about, I encourage all of us to read it, that talks about for any brand to progress in a small company today, you teach for differentiation, but they're learning something how to become better in their function. Not about your product, better in their function. And then you tailor your messaging for resonance, and then you take control of the sale. So as B2B companies, if you're going after, I mean, as, as, as FinTech, if you're going after B2B companies, that's a strong strategy that, would, that I, I, would, I would say that works for us. And I'll give you as a practical example, for Cooper, we can outspend, you know, we have some competition which is three letters, $100 billion company. We can't afford to spend as much as they do in O'Hare advertising or in you know, New, York Time, New York Manhattan advertising. But what we do is our buyer is the CFO, the economic buyer, and we partner with the economist. It's minimal investment and say, provide a thought leadership saying the strategic CFO in a rapidly changing world now I can go take that asset and market to every CFO in the world because we're teaching them something. And why wouldn't I want to read it as a CFO? So that is one way of building awareness is using thought leadership to build awareness. In this case, for example, I'll give you my personal example as we've done it with the Wall Street Journal and with The Economist. So the reality is from a marketing perspective is it's The Economist and it's Cooper. So it's the big one is going to be you know, who, the, who the primary person, the, the third party association is and the small is your brand. And using, it doesn't have to be The Economist and The Wall Street Journal for everybody, but using a partnership with a well-reputed firm in the fintech space or a, a publication, some thought leader, would be a great way for you to build brand because you can take that asset and use it to build your brand rather than trying to go do ads or something like that. From, and even, through, even through digitally, through retargeting and a number of initiatives that people do, it's a great way for you, for, for you to do that. The next one I want to talk about is acquisition. So now you've, if you've built awareness as a company, now I want to say that what's the fastest path to the most dollars? I mean, really, if you have, how many of us have sales teams in our organizations? Okay, there's about a few of us who are doing that. Now, every salesperson in an organization wants to know what's the fastest path to the most dollars, right? To do that, the simplest way to look at it is what's our ideal customer profile? What's the simple rinse and repeat motion I want to drive to get the most customers in the least amount of time. So the simplest way to look at it from that perspective is to say, where do we have the best rinse and repeat motion as a business? If you're running a business and says, where can I find customers with the best rinse and repeat motion? Now, very simply, it boils down to typically three things. Can I find a rinse and repeat motion based on the pain? So it's saying the challenge. A lot of people want to go to Home Depot to buy a shovel because they want to dig a hole. So the pain is to dig a hole. The shovel is what I'm going to go get. So can we start with the pain and say, what's the pain? And can I go drive a specific area of pain and say, so that's the rinse and repeat motion I'm trying to get and go build a business. That's one. 
to scale. Number two is by industry. You can say that, listen, in FinTech, I'm going after specifically this kind of sub-industry vertical, and I'm going to drive a rinse and repeat motion in that particular sub-vertical. And number three, it's by competitor, saying, I'm going to take this top, top competitor in this industry and go run a play to basically replace them, and that's the motion that I'm going to run. And it's interesting that when you take this initiative and be very focused, then you can be very successful in terms of driving scale into your pipeline and to your, into your sales motions. Now, if you're really sophisticated, you can go run a lot of mathematical models. Like someone like us who have achieved scale, run a lot of mathematical models, what we call propensity to buy modeling, which you say is that you look at the target customer profile, and you look at using machine learning, 30 different variables, and you say that, you know, you say if you have 1,000 accounts that you want to go after, it says that 5% have a 6x propensity to buy, and negative 15, and, and about 15% of accounts have a negative 6x propensity to buy. Propensity to buy is what is the probability of this, this prospect buying based on a number of criteria, competition, industry, vertical. Um, for example, in consumer, it's, it's demographic, it's location, et cetera, et cetera. But the simplest way is the, the, the simplest way for us to do it is to really think about it in terms of pain by industry and by competitor. So that's one, uh, tip number one for us to do in terms of our acquisition. The second one is once you've run this place is to figure out how do you bring sales and marketing together. Now a lot of times what happens is the biggest challenges in companies as you scale is sales is operating in one silo, marketing is operating in another silo. And your partnership organizations are operating in another silo. And a big thing you can do is once you know the place is bring these in the same synergies. For example, for our business, when we ran this as parallel, the prospects were not that good. But when we bought all these three functions together with one single goal, our prospects was pretty good. It really worked for us, right? It became really, really good, good looking for us. Um, but the idea there is sales and marketing is not driving two different focus areas, but they're all going after the same set of accounts in a synergistic way. It's easy to say on stage, it's billions of dollars and difficult to do in real life as you scale the company. So that's kind of the, 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 the alignment on that piece. And this is something, regardless of whether you're going after B2C or B2B, every one of us should do, called something called onlyness. It's a simple exercise, but you can hire a lot of consultants, you can hire agencies, you can hire a bunch of people to do it, but it's a simple exercise to distinguish what is unique about your offering. Every one of us has a product offering, I would presume, most of us do, some of us could be in the service, even in the services business. This concept of onlyness is very simple. You have a brand as a company, and you have a product. The simple question is, only my brand provides this unique promise that nobody else does, and only my product provides this unique differentiated value that nobody else does, regardless of what fintech business you're in, whatever business. If we can solve this in a very simple, differentiated, authentic way, it is really, really effective for us across the company for us to scale it. And it's not easy to do. So I'll give you my own experiences in this. Right? I work for a company called Marketo, um, got recently bought by Adobe for about $4.8 billion. And we were competing against Oracle and Salesforce.com, and we were providing a digital marketing platform. So we were going through this exercise of what is our onlyness? Because our sales teams would go into accounts, Oracle's sales teams would go into accounts, Salesforce's sales teams would go into the accounts. How do we compete? Because they got a lot of money. How do we compete? What do we say? So what is our differentiated offering at a brand level? So for us, simple. The way we said was what is unique about us that nobody else can fulfill is that Marketo was for marketeers by marketeers. In other words, we focused only on marketeers, whereas our competition, when Oracle Larry Ellison woke up in the morning, he was thinking about how do I build products for HR, for finance, for manufacturing, for you know, sales, and marketing was seventh on the list, whereas for us it was first on the list. So that was the brand purity, uniqueness that we could establish. And at a product level, we said some products are simple in our space called marketing automation, some products are very complex, but we are the right mix of this simplicity and comprehensiveness. Great taste, less filling. It's a great ad, by the way. 
that kind of combination that you can get. That was our way of distinguishing both at a brand level and a company level. So if I take it forward and talk about Coupa, we have a lot of competition in our market, right, in, in, in the spin management space. But what is unique about our brand is we say that we can help you to spend smarter together. That's unique because we have this community intelligence offering that nobody else has. I don't get into detail of what it is, but the reality is we have that unique differentiation nobody else does. And at a product level, we have a set of differentiators that we can defend. The defensiveness of that at a brand level and a product level is there. So my ask of you, for each one of you, whatever products you're doing, is really think about have you crystallized your onlyness at a brand and a product level in such a way, especially if you're a smaller company, that you can go to the market and explain your differentiation in a very simple, succinct way to your buyer audience. Right? And at IBM, it was great. Right? My experience at IBM is our brand level, the differentiation was trust. People never got fired for buying IBM. Our competition would beat us Monday to Friday. We would beat them on Saturday morning on the golf course because of the trust. And a CIO went to bed saying, the CIO of Bank of America or whatever went to bed saying, I'm not going to get fired for choosing IBM. Now, at a product level, we had so many products. We were kind of doing this. We had like thousands of products. There was no clear way for us to establish product differentiation. That was the failure there, that we could not do it. So, my ask of you is that as you scale your business, think about onlyness as a way for you to go establish your differentiation. And my guidance there is a lot of times when you do this, you can get very sophisticated and complex. So be more Forrest Gump than Forrester Research when you go through this exercise of simplicity <laughs> of, of doing through this. Because ultimately, some of the challenges in B2B that you don't have in B2C is that there is a salesperson sitting in some remote corner who has to repeat it to a customer. And it's, you're, you're designing all of this for the salesperson sitting in Abilene, Texas, not for the one sitting in the Bay Area, who's always close to the mothership. So simplicity is a big, big, big thing, theme in that and scaling the business. Then I'll go to the third piece, which is around adoption. Now, the interesting fact is in most B2B companies, is very few people focus on the number one problem that exists in B2B software, which is adoption. If you look at B2B, there's about, if you, if, uh, for IBM's example, example for me, there is lots and lots of software that customers buy and never use. They never use. Because they're sitting out there on the shelf because nobody actually focused on driving value, getting them successful. And in a SaaS, in a software as a service business, that's really challenging because when it comes to renewal time, the customer says, I didn't use it. I'm not going to pay for it. And as a result, your long-term lifetime value with that customer is going down. So the way to solve it is really for all of us, even as a small company, whether in B2B or B2C, is very simply ensure that customers fully consume the capability that they're paying for. Really making sure that are we getting whatever we have sold, the first mile problem is are they actually using this stuff and getting them to value. Not customer, not customer satisfaction, customer success. And that's the misnomer. Everybody's talking about customer satisfaction. It doesn't matter if customers are satisfied or not. The only thing that matters is customers are successful or not, and that only comes with adoption and, and driving that. And a lot of times what happens is people look at, you can look at adoption in multiple ways. You can scale it using marketing to make sure your customers are using your products. And you can scale it using your customer success organizations for those of us who do eventually to say that you're on in touch with the customer to make sure that before you go into any of the cross-sell and upsell part of your business, are they using what you're serving, okay? I'll end with the last piece, advocacy, and the most passionate piece. Because in today's world, we live in a peer-bound world. More about 85% of a buyer's journey is self-directed today, whether you're buying cars, or whether you're buying Coupa. So I'll give you a simple example, right? I was at, uh, we, my wife and I bought a car about two months ago. I bought my first car in 1992, which was an Acura Integra, which was the cheapest car, you, the coolest car you could find for the cheapest price coming out of college. But I went to the dealership, the first step in the process. The seller had all the power, all the power. The last car I bought, I went to the dealership, in the last step of the process, and the dealer had no idea that I was actually self-discovering my journey till I showed up and said, it's exactly the car I want, that's the price I want to pay, and I got all the research done. Guess what? Because I talked to my peers. It's a peer-bound world in everything we do, right? It's not like something that we're doing 
in terms of going to the seller. So the, the power has shifted from the seller to the buyer. And advocates make a big difference to a brand because there's no such thing, uh, no better thing than advocacy, especially in today's world, we're getting more influenced by peers. And interestingly, if you look at that, the big tip I would have for you, and among all the things I told you, is invest in building a tribe for your company. Really invest in building a tribe. And tribe is somebody who's passionate about your brand, somebody who's really passionate. When you talk about, when you look at your brand as a company, whatever product you're selling, you have three, th two, three types of people using your product. There's lurkers, there's likers, and there's lovers of your product. Lurkers, like, eh, whatever. Likers, yeah, I think this is a good product. Lovers love that product. And here's a great example of a lover. Let's see this. We swapped out the Whopper for a Wendy's burger to see what would happen. This is clearly a Wendy's burger. Square? Right. OK, they, they have the square patty. I hate Wendy's. What's going on? I, I eat Burger King. I don't eat Wendy's. What can I do to resolve this? All I want is a Whopper. OK. Get me a Whopper. Okay. <laughs> Whopper. Anything else is a freaking disappointment. It's pretty good. So that's that's a lover for the brand. It's a really cool lover. So we got to get how many? How do we take our lurkers to likers and likers to lovers for our brand, right? How do we do that? Now, interestingly, we swapped out the Whopper. I'm not going to do that again. Um, what you have to do is, you know, get more references for your brand, and and this is true in B2C. Like all of us use Yelp. In B2B, that's not as common today. Because what B2B companies are doing is focus a lot on, on their own website. When you come and there's a lot of great customer testimonials. If you go to somebody's B2B company's website, customers are saying it's great. You know, the baby is always good looking on a B2B company's website. But the reality is there are some ugly babies out there. <laughs> right? There are some ugly babies out there. But they're not going to tell that on your own channel. Your marketing team is never going to let you put it out there that the baby's not that good looking. So how do you do that to be authentic as a brand is you let your cross customers talk about your product in third party channels, right? Just like Yelp, there's B2B channels like G2 Crowd, Trust Radius, et cetera, because a lot of the prospects are going and looking at customer opinions, peer bound as I called it, and, and getting perspectives from that. So that's a great thing of being authentic. In today's world, everybody talks about AI, artificial intelligence. The true authenticity is authentic interactions, the other AI, which matters as much as artificial intelligence in, in, in today's marketing or today's how do you build a, a tribe from that perspective. And invest in third party channels to do that, what we call voice of customer initiatives. Now, here's my kind of soapbox moment for today's presentation, right? So I've done this for about 25 years. And what is my aha of how do you go from a startup to a $10 billion press brand that Cooper was, is, is today. And if you take this path, the journey starts, goes from startup, to you get to an IPO, you get to beyond, and then you get to become a mega brand. That's the goal. All of us, well, most of us want to do that. And there's obviously shareholder value that you're increasing as you go do that, especially even in the public markets. Now, as a startup, obviously we start a company because we've, we've figured out some unique, distinct, capability, white space that we want to go after. But a lot of times what happens is that you can never break this barrier from a startup to become IPO if you don't become a category leader in a category that matters. Like my experience is at Badgeville, a very sexy company in the gamification area. It was more feature than product than company. It's kind of that more of a feature than a company. But then you can get to be IPO. But if you can do category expansion, in other words, Salesforce.com, great example. They went IPO as SFA, Salesforce Automation, expanded their category to CRM, expanded their category to now all of platform, running platform as a service, continuous category expansion. So that lets you to kind of build, go from a public company to a mega brand. Another example of that is, you know, number of companies, for example, Salesforce has done that, IBM did it, and a number of other, like NetApp did a great job of doing this as a category expander. Cisco has done it in multiple spaces. VMware is now doing it, getting into different domains, expanding category to increase TAM. But that alone is not enough to become a mega brand. There's a combination of factors that need to be there. Category expansion plus community building. You got to have a tribe that is passionate about your brand to ultimately be a big brand. 
So in addition to building a great category, are people really passionate about your brand? Now it's difficult in B2B. In B2C, yes, you're appealing to human emotion, right? People wake up thinking about cars and perfumes and rides. They don't wake up thinking about ERP software and network routers and payment software. But the aha thing for us is that if you're a small company, invest in building your tribe early in your journey, early. Don't wait for you to go IPO to say, I wanna go build my tribe. Start day one. How do you build your tribe for you to be successful over time in your software products? Doesn't matter what FinTech company you're, you're starting. Now, how do you do that, right? What's some practical ways to do that? The, the first one is if, what we're trying to do is build a cool club. What do you want to say, this is the cool club. You want to be in my cool club. You know, what's the number one reason why people go to a cool club? Music, okay. Number one reason people go to a cool club. They could go because of the music. They go because of the dancing. They go because of the drinks, the lights, to look cool. Actually, the number one reason I feel people go to the cool club is guess what, the other cool people are there. That's why you go to the cool club. All the cool people are there in the cool club. So you want to be part of the cool club. And to do that, you have to inspire them to talk about the cool people that are already in the cool club. So showcase the hero stories of your brand, not the stories of your product, the stories of the people that have become better using your product. Difference. It's not like come customer coming and saying, hey, let me tell you, I used this FinTech software. It was great. It was awesome. Gave me 467% ROI. I got a great TCO on it, and I'm very happy. That doesn't inspire people as much. Let me tell you my story. I was sitting in the back office. Nobody was giving me respect. And then I transformed the function with this capability, and now I'm leading the change for my organization. I am the successful person. Anybody heard of Terrell Owens, the, the football player? So Terrell Owens has a great line, I love me some me. Guess what, every one of us does that, we like ourselves, and we have to showcase that. So a simple example of that is at Coupa, I'll give you one example. This is nothing to, we have a, we've launched an entire site called spendsetters.com. These are all people in, in, the, in the payment space who are all procurement officers. But this is talking about their success Amazon, DBS, Barclays, PFG, Procter & Gamble, United Airlines, BlackRock, MGM, Resorts, Campari, Lululemon, talking about each one of them and their success and how they're driving change and transformation. That's how you build a tribe. Inspire the people. It's about inspiring the tribe and getting these people the visibility that they need um, to make them kind of a celebrity of sorts. And this is something we've launched. It's one example. You could do it anyway saying it's nothing to do with our product. A separate site that talks about their success stories. Talked about a guy and how he learned, played football young in his life, and that's how he shaped him to be a leader. Another one about how he took risks early and how the guy at Lululemon is shaping the way how they buy their bags, the number one brand. And the number one brand value for them is their bags. And how his old personal story has led them to do that. The, the story of self, so the point is the story of self is a great way for you to build tribe and talk about that. And the second way I leave you with is a very powerful thing is those of us building products, think about how we can provide value to collectively the set of our buyers. Anybody uses Waze today? Okay, almost 50% of the audience today. Now, Waze is a great product for travel. And what Waze does is Collectively, we get smarter by using that product. The value is that by not being in that community, I don't get that intelligence, but the intelligence grows. The more the people in that community, the more the intelligence. You get smarter because more the people, there's more the routes, and it tells you the best route to take based on community intelligence. Imagine whatever FinTech product you're building, you provide that community intelligence that gives you value for every person of the tribe to be in that tribe. If they're not in it, they don't get it. If they are in it, the None of us is as smart as all of us, and that's the principle. So it's something for you to think about in tribe building. And for example, I'll tell you in Coupa, we have $1.3 trillion of cumulative spend that goes through our system. So every next customer that comes is smarter because we provide collective aggregated data on intelligence based on the other $1.3 trillion of cumulative spend. So the next customer is smarter because he's saying, hey, you're buying this commodity at a different price relative to everybody else because you're paying 20% higher because I have this aggregated data at an abstract level. So that level of community intelligence is another great way to build into our products in FinTech. 
for us to gain differentiation and build a tribe because collectively the community is smarter by being together. So those are some thoughts in terms of summarizing here. So first, for awareness, use thought leadership to build your brand rather than just any stage of your company. Two, think about what are the plays you want to run to run the ideal customer profile, simple plays of rinse and repeat in your business. Three, very importantly, crystallize your onlyness, your differentiation at a brand level and at a product level. Four, make sure customers actually adopt. Adoption is the first mile problem for any customer success. And five, build a tribe early in your journey so that once you get to scale, you can enjoy the benefits of tribe building. When we do that, what happens is that the gates of heaven open for us and it'll be awesome as any fintech company that's gonna be successful at scale. So that was my thing, and I thank you for your time, and I'll be available for any questions, all right? Thank you, guys, cheers.